Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> Aranya Wibanga Sutta, the analysis of non conflict. So have I heard. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Sawati in Jetta's Grove and at the Pindika's monastery. There, the Buddha addressed the mendicants. Mendicants, Venerable Sir, they replied. The Buddha said this. Mendicants, I shall teach you the analysis of non-conflict. This is Aranya Wibanga. Listen and pay close attention. I will speak. Yes, sir, they replied. The Buddha said this. So uh, just to point out, this is a very standard introduction, isn't it? to almost any of the suttas in Majjhima Nikaya. And it's not a, there's no sort of extra special additional elements. It's just a straightforward introduction. Um, the Buddha would always invite people to listen up before he would give a teaching. And I can just imagine, can't you, the sort of ways in which he would wait for the right kind of receptivity the right moment to actually begin to teach. Are they listening? Are they, are they prepared for this Dharma teaching? And so he would give a short preamble in this way. And also, of course, we always get to find out you know, where the teaching was given. And uh, more teachings than um, in any other place happened here at Sawati at Anathapindikas Park. Um, even to this day, it's a Buddhist pilgrimage site, and it's a beautiful big park, and there would have been quite a lot of uh, mendicants living in that area. Um, the area of Sarvati, and particularly in this, this uh, monastic boundary. So the Buddha spent many, many rainy seasons, many vassas at Sarvati. Um, so, so a lot of teachings come from this place. Okay, and then he begins. Don't indulge in sensual pleasures, which are low, crude, ordinary, ignoble, and pointless. And don't indulge in self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, and pointless. Avoiding these two extremes, the realized one woke up by understanding the middle way of practice, which gives vision and knowledge and leads to peace, direct knowledge, awakening, and extinguishment. So just to pause here, we can see that um, this is, in a way, a sort of potted version of the Buddha's very first teaching, isn't it? Um, the Dhammachaka Pawatana Sutta, where the Buddha um, is really pointing out, uh, we need to find the middle ground between the extremes of following pleasure or following pain. We need to find a, a balanced way of practicing. And this is really significant for us, isn't it? Because it's not actually that difficult to veer off into one direction or another. And so let's notice. Um, it's quite striking for me that the Buddha described sense pleasures in, in this quite a powerful way. Um, they are low, they are coarse, they are ignoble, they are pointless. So, uh, that's quite powerful. Uh, and the ascetic practices, if we're overly indulging in painful practices, the Buddha simply says, well, this is also ignoble and pointless. And of course, it's painful too. So how to find the middle way. Um, anyone like to come in at this point with any comments or reflections or questions? 
Okay, let's continue. He goes on, know what it means to flatter and to rebuke. Knowing these, avoid them and just teach Dhamma. So I've got to stop here as well, because there's just so much in this letter. <laughs> I mean, this is really interesting. Uh, very, very helpful pointer, isn't it? I would say not just in terms of teaching Dharma, but just generally, if we can consider this remarkable teaching. Uh, can we avoid, should we avoid, is it good to avoid flattery and chastisement? Uh, Niada. Yes, I would like to say something. Please. Uh, I, I have the other talk, uh, drama talk, the other group. I used to tell them, you know, if everyone in the whole world take 5% of Buddha, you know, First of all, no kill, no steal, no, no harm in sexual life, no, no lie, and no, no drunk drive around, you know. The whole world gonna be more peaceful. First of all, no kill is no war. First of all, you know, I yeah. mean, and uh, I think we, everyone right now in the talk should kind of like encourage everyone close to you and, have them kind of encourage another and another to take a 5%. You don't have to kind of like tell them it's Buddhist, you know, idea. Just tell them if every each one of us promise to ourselves, no kill, no steal, no, no wrong and sexual, no, no lie and no drunk. The whole world will get more peaceful. No drunk driver on the street. No, nobody steals some stuff from someone, you know, no cheating, no, you know, that mm -hmm. if we can do, if we can do, every one of us right now in the group can encourage everyone around you to take a 5%, you know, don't, yeah. you don't have to mention it's Buddhist or you do, it doesn't matter. But I think that maybe start to solve the problem. Yes. You know, that's what oh, I, that's all I want to say. <laughs> Sadi, 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 that is brilliant. Thank you so much for that reflection because I, you know, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's as simple as that in a way, isn't it? How beautiful that the Buddha's actually given us all the guidance we need for living a harmless life. And all we have to do, and only five, I mean, just by precepts. It's remarkable if we can just apply ourselves to following these precepts. You're right. How could there be war? Impossible. You know, and so many ways in which people suffer and inflict suffering on each other would be finished, done with. Um, I've heard it said that um, a person who follows the five precepts, this is a genuine human being. People who do not follow the five precepts, you can say, well, we're very close to animal realm. We're behaving then rather more like our uh, animal companions in this realm. We're behaving more like our distant ancestors. You know, we're behaving like a, from instinct and uh, we can do better than that. And indeed, human beings behave often worse than animals, don't we? Because we can be very cruel and do things um, out of cruelty and spite, which animals just simply don't do. As far as I know, then they don't have that kind of way of uh, punishing and hurting and harming each other. And so, you know, to be fully, properly, authentically human, uh, we can consider perhaps uh, would be to follow these five precepts. So there's a lot globally that we could do to improve the situation, but I really thank you for that, Niada, and I feel you're right. We should be encouraging both ourselves, also those around us. Uh, we don't have to talk Buddhism. We just talk about virtue, and even that word may not work, 
whatever works for people, we can encourage them <laughs> to keep the precepts. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, let's have Corinna and then Marilyn. Uh, Corinna. Oh, Marilyn, okay. Yeah, actually, go. Marilyn, go ahead. Corinna, Corinna, Corinna. It's okay, Corinna, you go first and then we'll have Marilyn afterwards. Okay, um, I was just gonna <laughs> reply to the, or respond to the, the sutta where it said, uh, know what it means to flatter and to rebuke. And yeah, that I do find that very interesting because um, to rebuke kind comes kind of natural. It's like, okay, rebuking is kind of like, oh, you're not doing that right. Yeah. Um, that's not pleasant to hear. <laughs> but to, to flatter, you, I have to, it's a little harder to understand. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, mm -hmm. yeah, so I'd, li I'd like to hear your words, of, uh, your, your thoughts about it. Um, uh, yes, I'll just I'll say. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Corinna, because I think that's a really good question. Uh, because we might think, well, flattery is quite good. I mean, it's encouraging each other, it's positive feedback and so forth. Actually, I think the sutta will answer your question. So I'm going to ask you to hang on in there and let's see whether we get some helpful guidance from the Buddha on this one. <laughs> Uh, Marilyn, yeah. Um, so I'll say two things. I, I think that the first comment, obviously, that would be a wonderful thing for all of us beyond people that are just studying the suttas. But um, I have some almost lifelong friends uh, that I try and share the Dhamma with or just share my personal experience, and they just put up blocks. I mean, it's almost like they're holding something in front of my face so I can't talk. And I know we, I'm not trying to convert anyone, but trying to share my happiness and my joy uh, and just meet tremendous um, opposition. You know, yeah. no interest. Like one of my friends thinks I'm in a cult. And, you know, it's, I don't know how to um, re-explain myself to someone to make them appreciate the, you know, what I'm doing and what it does for me. And uh, like I have friends, my sister is very, um, devoted Christian and so I try to tell her that what I experience must be what you experience when you go to church or something but there's a disconnect in their thinking and they don't want to see beyond what they're doing so I find that quite difficult and then um, I'll just say the other quick thing is just the last comment about um, um, plot flattering I think if you do someone something for someone and you're not expecting something back but you can see it was very helpful then i think you can tap yourself on the shoulder and say oh that was a good thing that i did so you, it comes from your heart and you do it and you're not expecting anything back but when you get a reply back or you see an action then you can flatter yourself mm -hmm. I think. so that was my two comments <laughs> thank you so much marilyn yeah um yeah, in terms of flattery, absolutely. I think we can give ourselves encouragement in the way that you've just described. That to me seems like quite a valuable thing, uh, not to create ourselves, but rather just to uh, bring up some kind of positive state of mind. Sometimes when we're feeling a bit like dragged down or there might be a tendency to be despondent, we can actually encourage ourselves. And I think that's something maybe uh, slightly different, but, but valuable. Uh, I'm interested, you know, to follow up on Corinna's point to see what the Buddha has to say. Why is flattery not a skillful thing? So I think we'll find out a bit more about that. And the, the, uh, the um, issue you raise about, yeah, you know, trying to uh, share the happiness and well-being of our practice and the benefits of the Buddha's teachings with others around us, just like the others saying to encourage people to notice the value of keeping precepts in whatever way we can describe that to them. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Sometimes you can sense there's a receptivity, there's a welcoming, there's an openness, and sometimes there just isn't. And I think really maybe we can say, oh, Oh, we have a chance to develop some discernment and like, <laughs> you know, and maybe some restraint as well, you know, that, you know, sometimes it's like uh, 
we we really want to offer something great, something good, but but it may not be received. And then, okay, I I maybe I need to just you know not not expend energy in this way, or maybe just allow people to feel a positive um, energy coming from me without words, you know, something like this. Um, and it's really like Marilyn, it's a process of uh, experiencing, isn't it? And then seeing the results of what we do and then, okay, we can readjust and so forth. But I, I really empathize with this sense of sometimes we just so want to share, but we, we notice that we can't. There it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, anyone else at the moment got any comments, uh, so, uh, reflections? Okay, let's go back to see what the Buddha says next. So, know what it means to flatter, know what it means to rebuke. Knowing these, avoid them and just teach Dhamma. Know how to assess different kinds of pleasure. And knowing this, pursue inner bliss. Mm -hmm. Let's go on a little. Don't talk behind people's backs. And don't speak sharply in their presence. Don't speak hurriedly. Don't insist on local terminology and don't override normal usage. This is the recitation passage for the analysis of non-conflict. So just a quick comment here to say that, you know, um, we, what the Buddha's doing here, we've just got the whole sutta in a way in a potted form. So rather than stopping on each point, I think we'll go on and hear what more the Buddha has to say about these points. But what he's doing is, is like a really, a really good way of presenting a teaching, isn't it? He's actually giving like a summary of the entire teaching here at the beginning, and then he's going to elaborate. And oftentimes he will do this in the suttas. And oftentimes also the Buddha might give a teaching in this way, give a short, Pracy, summary of a teaching. And then he might go away and invite one of the others, one of the other mendicants, or one of the other mendicants might be asked by their fellow samanas to elaborate, please, on this teaching of the Buddha. So it's quite interesting to see here we have this summary. And we're lucky in this case, the Buddha himself is going to continue to share on this topic. So the first point, don't indulge in sensual pleasures, which are low, crude, ordinary, ignoble, and pointless. And don't indulge in self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, and pointless. So we're coming back to this first point. The Buddha goes on, that's what I said, but why did I say it? Pleasure linked to sensuality is low, crude, ordinary, ignoble, and pointless. Indulging in such happiness is a principle beset by pain, harm, stress, and fever, and it is the wrong way. Breaking off such indulgence is a principle free from harm, pain, stress, and fever. And it is the right way. Indulging in self-mortification is painful, ignoble, and pointless. It is a principle beset by pain, harm, stress, and fever. And it is the wrong way. Breaking off such indulgence is a principle free of pain, harm, stress, and fever. And it is the right way. Don't indulge in sensual pleasures, which are low, crude, ordinary, ignoble, and pointless. And don't indulge in self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, and pointless. That is what I said. 
And this is why I say it. Avoiding these two extremes, the realized one woke up by understanding the middle way of practice, which gives vision and knowledge and leads to peace, direct knowledge, awakening and extinguishment. And that's what I said. But why did I say it? It is simply this noble eightfold path. That is right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right immersion. Avoiding these two extremes, the realized one woke up by understanding the middle way of practice, which gives vision and knowledge and leads to peace, direct knowledge, awakening and extinguishment. That is what I said, and this is why I said it. So it's an interesting refrain here, isn't it? That is what I said, and this is why I said it. That's quite, quite interesting. Um, for me, that brings a sense of it's like emphasizing the points again and again, and also perhaps a, a pause between these different expressions of this teaching. So the Buddha's again coming back to pointing out the middle way between the two extremes and how painful the two extremes are. Um, I find this a very helpful reminder. If we follow sense desires, it's painful, it's harmful, it's ignoble, it's a waste of time. So this is a really uh, strong and <laughs> very definite teaching here from the Buddha, which maybe we can remember when we start to notice ourselves being caught up and drawn and uh, attached to sense pleasures, just to consider this teaching. And mortification, uh, self-torment in different ways uh, is also painful and ignoble and pointless. So the middle way then, the Buddha goes on to say, is simply this eightfold path. And uh, coming back to Niyadi, you know, there you are. It's, he's really saying if we practice the five precepts, right speech, right livelihood, then this is, this is the middle way. Uh, also developing wisdom, developing right view, right intention, harmlessness, the intention to renunciation, to letting go of sense pleasures or the attachment to sense pleasures and developing our practice, our meditation practice right concentration, right mindfulness, uh, right effort. So these, all these factors, this is the middle way that the Buddha is pointing to. So what a beautiful summary, actually, of the entire teaching of the Buddha. And as I said, this is the very first teaching of the Buddha, in essence, uh, that he gave to his five spiritual companions. Um, the first time he really spoke on Dharma. And so this is being repeated here as the beginning part of this beautiful teaching on avoiding conflict. So anybody like to come in with any questions, thoughts, reflections at this point? Okay, let's continue. We're gonna to come to our crucial point now that we want to investigate further on Know what it means to flatter and to rebuke. Knowing these, avoid them and just teach Dharma. Just speak on Dharma. This is what I said, but why did I say it? How is there flattering and rebuking without teaching Dharma? In speaking like this, some are rebuked. Pleasure linked to sensuality is low, crude, ordinary, ignoble, and pointless. All those who indulge in such happiness are beset by pain, harm, stress, and fever, and they are practicing the wrong way. In speaking like this, some are flattered. Pleasure linked to sensuality is low, crude, ordinary, ignoble, and pointless. All those who've broken off such indulgence are free of pain, harm, stress, and fever, and they're practicing the right way. 
So those who were able to follow this teaching, those who were able to let go of sense pleasures, who were able to uh, free themselves up or begin to free themselves up from this attachment to pleasure, um, they can feel flattered by such a teaching. And likewise, in speaking like this, some are rebuked. Indulging in self-mortification is painful, ignoble and pointless. All those who indulge in it are beset by pain, harm, stress and fever, and they're practicing the wrong way. Hmm. In speaking like this, some are flattered. Indulging in self-mortification is painful, ignoble and pointless. All those who've broken off such indulgence are free of pain, harm, stress and fever and practicing the right way. And in speaking like this, some are rebuked. All those who've not given up the fetters of rebirth are beset by pain, harm, stress and fever and they're practicing the wrong way. In speaking like this, some are flattered. All those who've given up the fetters of rebirth are free of pain, harm, stress and fever and they're practicing the right way. That's how there is flattering and rebuking without teaching Dhamma. So I think we can gather from this that if we speak um, on the teachings of the Buddha in terms of individuals, uh, then people may take the teachings in such a way that they will feel criticized or flattered by the simple Dharma teachings. So when the teachings are personalized, then the response can be uh, tainted by the sense of self coming in. I'm doing well, I'm not doing well. And it's all about me, me and you, right and wrong, us and them. So this is a really interesting and helpful point for us. Um, Let's just see what the Buddha says next. So he goes on. Um, how is there neither flattering nor rebuking, just teaching Dharma, just speaking on Dharma? You don't say pleasure linked to sensuality is low, crude, ordinary, ignoble and pointless. And all those who indulge in such happiness are beset by pain, harm, stress, and fever, and they're practicing the wrong way. Rather, by saying this, you just teach Dhamma. And here's how to say it. The indulgence is a principle beset by pain, harm, stress, and fever, and it is the wrong way. Again, you don't say pleasure linked to sensuality is low, crude, ordinary, ignoble, and pointless. All those who've broken off such indulgence are free of pain, harm, stress, and fever and practicing the right way. Rather, by saying this, you just teach Dharma. You say, breaking off the indulgence is a principle free of pain, harm, stress, and fever, and it is the right way, and so forth. The Buddha goes on to give the same example in relation to self-mortification. And finally, he also gives the example of not saying all those who've not given up the fetters of rebirth are beset by pain, harm, stress, and fever and practicing the wrong way. You say, to just teach Dharma, you would say, when the fetter of rebirth is not given up, rebirth is also not given up. This is how there's neither flattering nor rebuking, just teaching Dharma just speaking on Dharma, know what it means to flatter and to rebuke, and knowing these, avoid them, and just teach Dharma. This is what I said, and this is why I said it. So here we are, here's the explanation. And I do find this very helpful. And I, I note that um, in the Pali language, in the scriptural language, which will be very close, to the languages that the Buddha would have used when he was teaching way back 2,600 years ago. In these languages, 
uh, in the Pali language. Um, there's a tremendous emphasis on this kind of way of speaking, which is more objective. And there's a, a very um, less emphasis on speaking personally. So there's much yes, less use of pronouns, you could say. And so how interesting that actually the Buddha's pointing to this as a, something to be conscious of, something to consider when we speak on Dharma. So when we speak on truth, when we share truth, when we speak on spiritual practice, when we perhaps even, <laughs> when we speak generally, uh, to try to uh, consider how if we speak in terms of persons, we might be flattering some and rebuking others. We might be causing some kind of, how to say, even conflict, even conflict between people. Uh, a crude example would be, say, you, you point, point to somebody in the community and praise them highly for what they've done today. <laughs> and we might think, well, that's really nice to do that. Uh, but actually, other members of the community who've been working hard and making right effort and practicing well might feel a little despondent. <laughs> or maybe they might actually even have a little trace of kind of jealousy or envy or aversion towards the one who's getting praised or the one who's praising. So I think actually we can take it at this level and consider how our speech, even when flattering, never mind rebuking, uh, which is kind of obvious, we can, we can t quite obviously understand how personal rebukes can be a cause of suffering. But even with flattery, how our words can cause suffering for others. So it's quite interesting. And uh, particularly, I would say, in teaching Dharma, this is a really important principle, not to speak about personal attributes, but to speak generally on what is true, what is wholesome, what is unwholesome, and so on. So I welcome any uh, comments, reflections, questions about this point in the sutta. Is that clear to everyone? Does that make sense to you, Corinna? Yes, yes. Um, it's good, yeah. It's, yeah. I, I just, I find this absolutely fascinating because um, I've been thinking about this kind of speech for a long time. Um, and, and yeah, I'm trying to wrap, wrap uh, like how, how to say, how to point out things without making people uh, feel defensive. <laughs> but at the <laughs> same time, basically, like, let's say someone's putting their shoes in the wrong place. You're like, how do how do I point out the fact that the shoes go over here <laughs> without causing conflict? You know, you know, you, you, it's not all up to me. Um, it depends on how the person takes it also, but that's certainly a much more skillful way of speaking and sort of the, the phrase that's coming that I'm making up in my head is don't flatter or rebuke the person, but flatter and rebuke the principal. Mm. Like, nice. Yeah. The question I would have, though, when not regarding Dhamma is like sometimes it just Dhamma is one thing, but then other things I feel like they're my opinion. <laughs> so it's hard to. <laughs> speak yeah. The principle. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, we can really make these kind of distinctions. And that's a really helpful point that you just made about. Um, it's the qualities, not the people. And I really find that helpful. I think that pinpoints in a way um, to me what the Buddha is trying to express and to guide us towards. Um, yeah, that is in fact reality, isn't it? That is more real to see that uh, it's the sinner, not the sinner, you know, <laughs> that we want to really um, work with uh, and uh, not to um, create people actually not to create people where there where there are simply these just these wholesome or unwholesome dhammas 
Um, it helps us to see more clearly if we look at things in this way and if we can express this through our speech, how helpful is that? How peaceful, how uh, true, you know. Thank you so much, Karina. Yeah. If I may make one more little comment, because um, sometimes it helps me, like let's say, you know, you, you, you think you're doing the right thing, but then the reaction is <laughs> not, not pleasant. And so I think, oh, did I, did I do the right thing? There's sort of doubt. And, and if I go back to these principles and I can be like, okay, well, did I speak in a flattering or rebuking way, for example, or you know, did I, I can kind of check myself and be like, okay, no, I, I did speak correctly or, or no, I, I, I personalized it. Um, and then I can sort of like own what I did and like let the person's reaction, let them own what they did, their reaction. Yeah. That's really good because, yeah, it's often in reviewing situations that we learn the most, isn't it? So just to see that and tease out where we can, yeah, uh, somehow feedback can be received. Uh, it is possible to receive feedback and it is possible to give feedback in a way that's really acceptable, isn't it? And how to find that way, how to get to that way of speaking that is uh, not uh, like uh, the person doesn't feel personally judged or blamed but rather you're you're sharing some helpful information here <laughs> i hope <laughs> yeah yeah thank you i mean this is a huge area isn't it for us to explore and we can only really touch the surface today but um this is really helpful thank you so much for your great comments um anyone else yeah didn't we uh, would you like to speak? Um, yes, I have a question um, on the self-mortification, which um, I'm curious why Mahakasapa was allowed to continue to be an ascetic once he became part of the Sangha, I guess. And he obviously was quite important because after the Buddha died, he was like the, one of the main people. So that's always been um, confusing to me. Mm. Why he? Yeah, thank you, Dave. Yeah, thanks for that question. It is interesting um, because the Buddha, yeah, was very clear that um, self mortification is kind of veering off the path to a certain extent. Um, however, he did allow uh, the monks and nuns to practice certain amounts of renunciant practices that were considered to be suitable. Um, so there are the Dutanga practices, and I think there are 13 of them that we're allowed to take on if we wish. And they're kind of ascetic practices, or well, they're definitely ascetic practices. Um, they, they don't involve um, harming the body in any way. Um, they don't involve pushing us beyond our limits, but it's things like, yeah, having one meal a day that we collect on arms round or sleeping out in nature, you know, rather than in a building, um, wearing coarse robes or robes that are just uh, rag robes, you know, uh, robes that we might, uh, you know, we might accept robes when our robes get a little bit frayed or a little bit damaged, um, but one can keep the same robes and patch them and just keep wearing the same ones uh, for much longer. Um, all sorts of, you know, ascetic practices that were allowed. And Mahakasapa was uh, practicing, I think, all the Dutanga, but this was acceptable. And he didn't uh, veer beyond that allowance from the Buddha. So I think in this way, um, he was kind of within the, following the vineyard, you know, for the monks and nuns, um, within which there is this kind of latitude, there is this scope. And many, many monks today, you know, in Thailand will practice the Dutanga practices when they're young and fit and they're able to do so. Um, it's, it's not discouraged. It's also not necessary. It's, it very much depends on the person. 
Um, the Buddha did say that the Dutanga practices can be very valuable for people who have a lot of sense desire, a lot of uh, greed, a lot of passion. They're particularly helpful for such people, people who have a lot of aversion, um, who are working more with negative mind states. Um, it's not so uh, valuable for them. It's good for them to take care of their bodies, take care of their minds and work with the aversion in ways that are, are less uh, challenging, if you like. Does that make sense for you there? Yeah. Okay, uh, Linda. Hello. Um, yeah, just a thought came up when we were talking about uh, praising. I thought um, in a situation where um, you have an event and someone has organized the event and organized the volunteers, the activity and done all, a, a great deal of the work. You've got volunteers doing some of the work and you've praised this person and you've thanked the volunteers. And if a volunteer feels, I think, jealous or envious about that, that's kind of on them. It's something they need to work on. I, I just don't understand like why, you know, praising that person who's done all this work uh, how that's you know that's something you shouldn't do yeah but, you know like because basically I feel like if a, somebody else feels like they've been slighted somehow and they were thanked and not praised that you know that's something you need to work on <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's like I don't think the person who uh, hired or, or, or brought this leader in to, to, to do the event has to feel that they can't praise them mm. yeah I hear you um yeah, it's a really subtle point, I think, isn't it? Um, because, um, yeah, it can be encouraging for people to be um, told how well they've done or thanked for doing a good job and so forth. They're just, um, yeah, so that they're valued. You know, they feel like they've yeah. been valued. Yeah. I, don't think, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know? No, um, it's hard to say that that's a bad thing. Um, it, it's quite nice to praise and encourage people. And, you know, there are places in the Buddha's teachings where he, he encourages and praises people. Um, he really is pointing though in this sutra, I think, to again the the where is the where is the what is the praise for? Well, the praise is for qualities like such as generosity or making effort, um, you know, selfless service. One can praise these things and I can appreciate how um, actually when we speak more generally about uh, how much we appreciate these good qualities, then those who have been manifesting those good qualities will tend to feel praised. <laughs> and those who are not will tend to think, oh, maybe, maybe I can develop these good qualities as well. But it's not actually singling out um, people in an overt way. Um, so I, I, I think it, you know, I really hear you and I agree with you that um, one can use praise in a way to encourage everybody. But, but I'm interested in this emphasis the Buddha's giving us on not singling out individuals as much as bringing up uh, appreciation for, for good qualities. And I wonder if that could be even more uh, kind of effective and helpful and remembering the sutta is all about avoiding conflict so whether it's more harmonizing to be speaking in, a, in about qualities rather than persons potentially I think it probably is more harmonizing in that way what do you think Linda yes I was yeah I, I, I get I have I get the idea I was just thinking to you about um the rebuking part, which is like, mm -hmm. how do you work it if it's your, if it's an employee and you have to talk to them about a poor job performance or some yeah. kind of issue that they're having on, on the, in the workplace? Like, how do you not do that? Like, that's part of what you're getting paid to do. Like, as I say, you're a supervisor, you're getting paid to do that and you have to, that's part of your job. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it, it, I can see it more as a quality of like, because if you go to individuals, it's like, I can see all kinds of pitfalls or things where you have to do it because your, your boss will expect you to do that. You know, that's part of what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And if you're not doing it, you're going to be in trouble with yeah. the one with, with your manager, you know, so there's yeah. all kinds of, it, 
issues with, you know, like when you have to talk to somebody about something that, that they're not doing right or they're doing it wrong or yeah. be as nice as possible about it, but you still have to talk to them about it, you know. Yeah, so. I, I really hear you. I mean, it's so interesting, isn't it? How do we how do we give negative feedback? Right. Um, yeah. How do we give negative feedback without, you know, okay, in this case, the word the Buddha is using is not to rebuke. So we can say, let's consider that. How do we give negative feedback without actually rebuking somebody, uh, without, say, shaming them or humiliating them or, you know, just leaving them in a state of, uh, you know, feeling despondent or feeling self-critical and so forth? A very interesting question. And uh, I don't know the answer or anything, um, but I'm, I'm curious about applying this teaching then. So to, to, to speak about qualities rather than persons, um, could we do that when giving negative feedback? Could we speak about how, I don't know, how challenging it is for me when I, when I uh, can't seem to um, uh, notice that uh, certain things are, are, are happening when certain things are not happening that that I, I was expecting to happen um, how that feels for me and can you help me with that <laughs> I don't know I really don't know but I'm, I'm curious about it and I wonder if you could let's just contemplate basically let's contemplate these teachings and with with a lot of the Buddhist teachings I find um, it's so helpful just to let them sort of percolate you know, in the system and, and see how that might be able to kind of inform and support how we, how we relate to the people around us in whatever situation, you know, in work situation, family life, in community life. Um, how do we find a way to uh, give negative feedback with love, um, with precision, you know, getting just the truth right. out there to the other persons, giving them the information that they need, giving them the info they need in the, in the most generous, loving way that we can. Um, yeah, without blaming and judging the person, but just saying how certain qualities are really a bit difficult to work with or certain qualities we need to look at together and see if we can find a way to overcome them. <laughs> Something like that. Um, be just the spirit of the thing as far as um, not being shameful or um, yelling at someone or, you know, yeah. being mean spirited and not doing that and just doing what you need to do and say what you need to say, and as you said, in the nicest way possible. Yeah, you know, that it's really, it is really possible, isn't it, to consider, I mean, the Buddha actually gave lots of wonderful teachings about how to give feedback and when, you know, and so actually, like in your job, Linda, what a call for you to um, be able to bring the, these qualities to the fore, you know, when giving feedback. So the qualities the Buddha described as, uh, do I have a heart of loving kindness? Um, is my speech gentle? Is it true? Is it timely? You know, uh, can it be received? Um, we have to try, don't we? Sometimes in this sort of situation, you have to do. You have to actually say something. So it may not be well received, but I can. I can speak with a heart of loving kindness. I can speak the truth, and I can really, you know, have this person's welfare in the foreground in my mind. And I think when we have these, when these qualities are in place, you know, it's the best we can do, isn't it, to uh, enable a good result? What do you think? I think so, yeah. That's, that's the way yeah. I, want. I mean, it's sometimes it's hard to interpret the, the, the scripture as far as, okay, now that was then, what about now? Like, how do I interpret it to modern times? And, okay, I have this situation and, you know, I don't really, I can't do that for, whatever reason or I have to do it differently in some way so yeah there's flexibility there with, uh, absolutely <laughs> so, like, uh, you know they don't talk about employment situations and things like that so <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> well I don't know I think I actually my sense is actually that you know what I think these teachings are totally relevant for, for us for us today 
Uh, and that's something I love about the Buddha's teachings, that they're really kind of applicable here and now. And it's really interesting how, yeah, you know, in, in the workplace, I've noticed myself that, um, you know, it can be quite challenging to, to fulfill the requirements for our livelihood and to really practice in accordance with the Buddha's teachings. But the beauty is to actually make the make the attempt, you know, to actually see how can I how can I apply these teachings to this situation? Yeah. And um, I, I'd love Linda to um, uh, you you probably know this already, but um, the the Buddha's teachings on giving feedback are really wonderful. So um, I wonder how I can get those to you. Can you put your email on there? Mm, uh, Oh, <laughs> can you put my email on the chat? Um, if if I give you my, I, 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 you. <laughs> I want to give you, you my email, email address. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. I, I can send you mine if you want. It's up to you. Oh, okay. Um, it's okay. Venerable Satin is going to put my email on the chat, and okay. Um, just drop me your email, and I I'll send you the references. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, because you know they're just so interesting and helpful. And for any situation, I would say, well, we have, we're in that situation where we, we're required to give some feedback that is not necessarily going to be easy for the hearer, for the, the other person to receive. Um, yeah, <laughs> I really hope that'll be helpful. Okay, uh, Marilyn. <laughs> Fire away, Marilyn. Um, well, I was thinking when she was talking, you know, if you're in a position certain things have to be done a certain way and there is an error. There's, when I was working, um, there was no margin of error for certain things that have to be done. But uh, rather than use, rebuking someone for making a mistake, um, mm -hmm. I used to come in and say, well, if you do it this way, um, you'll have better results or turn it more into something teaching rather than feeling when something wrong has been done that you have to respond with with a rebuke because you have that responsibility of getting things done properly um so so that's what i tried to do um, and maybe possibly i wasn't even um thinking compassionately i think why better do this this way but um just trying to turn it into a different situation instead of talking about mistakes that we're making somehow create a, the conversation so you're teaching them how it should be done rather than not um and then i think it's i receive better and i think it's a better teaching for an individual than um feeling because they made a mistake that you've got to kind of single them out and just create mm -hmm. another way of of them um, responding yeah thank you thank you for that yeah um, any ways that we can kind of, yeah, fall in line with the kind of guidelines um, that the Buddha gives to speak gently, speak with loving kindness. However, we can do that. That's a that's a lovely um, point to there, Marilyn, that you shared, which is like to see ourselves as in in a way we've got an opportunity to to teach. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we can have an idea in our cultures nowadays that. A teacher-student relationship. There's a power gradient or a status gradient, but but actually, um, it doesn't have to be that way at all. It's as a friend, you know. How can I? Oh, I, I have some info for you. How can I? Can I just share that with you and how how to do that in a good way? So, yeah, to to have in mind, I'm I'm just sharing and teaching something useful here. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> Okay, uh, Aranya Bodhi, Venerables. Uh, did you have a hand up there? Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I just had a thought about uh, what Linda was saying. Um, she's mentioned, you know, if somebody feels um, you know, like other people being flattered and they feel hurt by that. Mm. My connection is unstable. Are you hearing me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Anyway, Linda said, well, isn't that on them? Isn't that on them if they take it that way? Yeah. And I think she's right. It, it, it absolutely is. Um, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> similarly, some you can it's the way it's on them ultimately. And, you know, even if we are speaking in this very skillful way of like talking about the qualities rather than the people, still the people, depending on who they are, they might be identified with those qualities. They might think, um, you know, I'm a hard worker and I'm this and that and, and the other, right? Um, so then even if you're praising quality and not person, still the person can take that as, as part of their self because that, that's how, you know, that's how they're thinking about it. That's how they're understanding their identity and so forth. And so, I, I mean, I guess I take it more, not so much as like how to make the other people understand properly, but how to have my own heart properly engaged in this kind of conversation, because it's about non-conflict. It's about not making that conflict in my own heart. Mm -hmm. um, like not saying, oh, these people are bad because they do this, or these people are good because they do that. It's like um, just, you know, because then you're making them, you're making them into a person who is good or a person who is bad. And then that can be like the, the start of a, of a conflict and of a, um, then you're setting yourself up against them, me and them, and um, or at least them as an object of some sort. And uh, then it's not just, you're not thinking of it as just, you're thinking of it as a person. And then you're getting into conflict with that person potentially. Yeah. So it's, Part of this is just to be very clear in, in yourself um, about how to avoid making these qualities into solid things and making them into people and putting yourself up against mm. them, regardless of what they do. Um, mm. But to not be doing that yourself is sort of how, how I, I take this. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I just actually really appreciate it what Linda said, it is on them um, <laughs> and it's on us. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Venerable Kachina. Um, that's a really valuable point, an important point that, yeah, we, how much are we responsible for? Well, we're responsible for our own uh, inner experience, our own reactions, our own ideas, our own thoughts and feelings, and, and that we can work with. Um, and when it comes to, yeah, relating feedback to others, we do the best we can. Um, and it is possible sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, you have a, a heart of loving kindness, you give the true uh, and valuable and beneficial feedback, and then the other person has some kind of uh, reaction. Well, we, we also need to know uh, how not to take other people's suffering on board and to make that kind of distinction, do our best and stay here, you know. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. And Linda, I hope that really meets what you were trying to express because, um, yeah, this is all in the spirit of understanding the Dharma together. So everybody's contribution is so, so gratefully received. Thank you, Venerable Katrina, for that lovely uh, and important point that you've made there. Uh, Din we your turn. Um yeah, I'm just curious, is there, what does the Pali word say? Because I, on, I always thought flattery meant insincere praise and another site translated as extolling, which is praising enthusiastically. Mm. So I'm curious if, because a lot of these mm. translations can be a little bit yeah. off. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, it's so true. Let's have a look at the Pali. Okay. Usadanancha, uh, apasadanancha, usadanancha, usadana. Do you have a dictionary with you, Venable? Um, I've got on my phone, but I don't have it with me. Um, or over to Venerable Kachina might possibly have a dictionary there. Or just know. Uh, you may I, just I will know. pull it up. It'll take me a minute. Thank you. 
Usadanan. Usadana. We'll look at that word, didn't we? Thank you so much for that, because we need to tease out the actual meaning. We're going to come back to that. We'll let Venerable Kuchayana have a look for us. And meantime, Niada. You're on mute, Niada. You're muted at the moment. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, we're just going to follow Buddha. Buddha said, you know, teach them drama, you know, whatever it is, because teach them to understand that you have eye, you have ear, and you receive things, and then you feel inside. So when you teach that, before you give them a, a lesson that they done something wrong, so you tell them first, like, you know, you have, you know, like, you receive in that, and you know, you who is responsibility for have something done right. You have mm -hmm. to tell them first, you have someone else, the whole people for you to responsibility to have this thing put, put out right. Everyone have eye ear to go in and touch the feeling. Mm -hmm. So if you keep that true about even you who just about gonna get the lesson, you have to understand that what I give to you, you have to go and analyze is that I do for your good deed, <laughs> for your good job, you know? <laughs> so I think just teach them drama. Like you receive from your ear, from my word, because I, for me, I see from the eye that something done wrong, you know? You, you open up with teaching drama and then you up end up with lead them to the right path. Maybe before they're gonna heartbreaking, they understand to not take that in as a personal. I think maybe that's, that's could be a, a good result. Mm. For me, I, I probably do that because um, so many times have someone, you know, put, put a fit on me without I done anything to that person. Mm. But I just don't react. I just take it in and just like last time we talking about anger, you know, just kind of like make yourself like a rat. I, I make myself like an old dirty rat. Whatever you want to do to me, you, you want to clean yourself, you want to, you know, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm, I am nothing. I'm just an old, old, uh, old dirty rat. So you can throw the dirty word, whatever, I take it. I, I'm just not going to make it go in and feel bad about it. You know, if, if you're in practice and teach them that, I think that would be a good result. That's all I want to say. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. You know, it leads us to, doesn't it, the reflection of how to receive feedback also. Uh, and that is really helpful because... Um, Again, uh, if there's flattery, if there's rebuke, how do, we, how do we meet that? How do we receive that? How do we make use of that? And surely in the same way, yes, indeed, Niada. There's like an encouragement, isn't there, to okay, extract the Dharma from this. What is the, of value? What is beneficial? What is true? Uh, what can I take as a teaching here? And anything else, I can just you know, set that aside. And so that's a really lovely reflection. Thank you so much. From the other perspective of the receiver of perhaps flattery or rebuke. Um, thank you so much, Venerable Kachayana. We've got the, um, okay, we've got the translation. Um, I don't know if I can put it up here. Um, that's actually something I said, I can put that up, but uh, ah, I have is. here, uh, which essentially you can have this word by word look up. So oh, Usada. yes, of course, I was forgetting. Yeah, excellent, yes. excellent. Okay. So Usada, raise oneself up, rising up. Um, and then the rebuking, apasadanancha, is um, reproach or disparagement. Mm. So. Excellent, thank you very much. That's really good to see, isn't it, everyone? So, you know, um, it was just as you said, um, see if I can come back to, 
just see if I can come back to um, yeah, us all. Other <laughs> translations, no <laughs> or disparage. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yanamoli. Uh, and let's see, what does Sudaso has this too? Uh, where is it? He also has flattery and disparagement. So. Right. Flatter, oh, marriage, but to raise oneself up, basically, mm. um, oneself big, something of the sort. Very good. Yeah, didn't we? Um, it's really, you were really pointing to that there, that it's something to do with sort of kind of inflation, isn't it? It's kind of, yeah, lifting above. Um, that's helpful, isn't it? Because you know, when we're trying to translate from the Pali into the English, it's very difficult to capture the exact meaning, but we could consider it as something like, couldn't we, like making something above the level or putting something below the level, um, perhaps as simple as that. Would you like to come in, didn't we? Is there anything you could add here for us? I would, yeah, I was just gonna yeah. say, cause the obviously, everybody's point about giving authentic praise is valid. Mm. And so I was just wondering, I just thought, well, maybe it was the translation because it seemed like flattery is not something I would want to do <laughs> to anybody. Mm. I don't want to give insincere praise. Mm. And that's just, um, that's, um, that's not authentic. It's really not the way of the Dharma. Yeah. So I think that for me, at least, uh, it's very clear now. Excellent. So hopefully that cleared up any confusion for other people as well. Yeah, thank you so much. It really has helped a lot because, yeah, to make the distinction between um, authentic feedback that is praising or not so uh, appreciative of something, yeah. And to do this lifting up or putting down, which is uh, almost like it's a it's a different it's, there's a difference, isn't there? Yeah, um, I mean, even thank extolling, you, yeah. extolling sounds like an exaggeration of what is the truth yeah. to me. Yeah. To praise someone so enthusiastically is like it's a little bit on the other, it's, a, it's an extreme, which on obviously the spiritual path says we need to stay in the middle of the road or in the middle yeah. way, so. Yeah. I don't I mean, need to jump up and down if I'm going to give praise. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's really, that's really helpful because, so, so let's consider that, yeah. And back to Linda again, you know, it's like, um, you wouldn't be doing that. You wouldn't be uh, putting someone down or lifting someone up in a way that's not authentic. It's more like you're trying to convey uh, mm -hmm. truths and how to do that skillfully. So, so that's really helpful to understand just exactly what the Buddha is pointing to. There's a sense of exaggeration, maybe. A sense of over, over something that's not completely genuine and true in the way in which we relate to people, in these ways of um, speaking to flatter or to rebuke. Um, the whole other field of how we give feedback is something really worth looking at at some time. But in the context of this teaching, I think you've really got it there for us. Um, and let's consider how helpful to come back to the Pali. And now we have the dictionaries at the ready. We can do this if we need to for some other parts of the sutta. Anybody else want to speak about this point? I had, uh, Jeff had his uh, hand up. Thank you, Ananaya. Jeff, go ahead. I was going to add something. I think you both sort of touched on it though. In the uh, right speech talk, when he says it should be true, beneficial, kind, endearing and timely or something. Um, it's like a matrix of which ones you do, right? And sometimes you might not do one of those things because all the other four apply, except for truthful. It always has to be truthful, right? But so this might be one of those where, yes, generally you should try to do this, but there are cases where you do need to rebuke someone because it, as long as you do it 
kindly, beneficially, truthfully at the right time, that you would still go ahead and rebuke or praise because it's appropriate, it's necessary. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you very much, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, I think we can consider all these ways in which we need to kind of check ourselves before we give feedback to see if the kind of um, the time is right, if the heart is in the right place, and absolutely to the one. Uh, the most significant and important um, quality is to have, uh, to at least, as far as we know, to be speaking the truth, uh, to have uh, authenticity behind what we're saying. Um, but yeah, sometimes didn't the Buddha say, yes, it, um, what we have to say may not be well received. It may not be pleasant for the hearer. And in these cases, we need to exercise caution, but speak when, you know, be willing to speak, um, try and find the right time. And uh, this is the kind of situation that Linda's sharing with us, isn't it? Where you, you are actually in a situation, you have to say something that may well not be easily received, but you have to do your best. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Jeff, for that. Um, back to Aranya Bodhi, Venerables. Thank you. I just wanted to share a teaching I received one time from Ayatollah Loka, which really stuck with me about receiving praise. Very brief teaching. Um, she had taken me to an, another temple to pay respects to, to the seniors there and um, wanted to consult with the senior about some aspect of my situation and uh, talk to him about it. And to that end, she started by um, giving me high praise to saying very nice things about me to this, this senior and saying, uh, you know, they've got five stars in this, 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 this. And she gave a list, five stars, five stars. And then she turned to me and said, not to be proud because then you lose your stars. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, my stars, <laughs> right? Like, um, because it's, it's not like those good qualities are there, but the pride and taking it on is like my stars. That's, it, it's, it, you lose it. You lose your stars when you take it on in that way as mine. And um, so that's just coming to mind. I thought I'd share that. I, I do often think about it, oh, my stars. <laughs> I'm losing my stars. <laughs> Oh, I do. That's lovely. Thank you for sharing that with us, Venerable. <laughs> yeah, isn't so much of our suffering in these ways, relational ways, and the, the conflict that can arise, so much of it is to do with circling around and involved with the sense of self. And if we can let go of taking, uh, or in a way, taking our lives personally, then we can really... Uh, you know, open to the truth, the way things are, and, uh, uh, you know, free up, free up, and uh, receive, uh, as, as you said, Miada, you know, be like a rag, uh, we can, we can receive, we can mop up, <laughs> mop up the messes, you know, uh, as soon as we start to identify, we can start to get caught up. And um, both uh, giving flattery or rebuke, this is something I think most of us will be able to uh, really discern and avoid flattery and rebuke in the way that we've come to understand it uh, through looking at the Pali in this sutta. Um, when, but should we receive flattery or rebuke? Um, high praises. Um, obviously, in the case of Venerable Kachina, well-deserved, uh, you know, applicable, uh, appropriate praises. Um, but even so, you know, can we receive praise? Can we receive feedback without uh, getting caught up and identifying with it? This is a good reflection for us all, isn't it? Thank you for that great teaching from Wayata Taloka. <laughs> okay, anyone else at this point on this very, very helpful teaching? Um, examining and exploring this teaching. Ananea. Actually, it's not my thought, but I, uh, Linda um, 
put something in the chat just a short while ago, and it just uh, about intention. So intention and timing are absolutely key to this, to, to this um, clarity and communication and um, uh, uh, giving the best chance that it will be received in a way that can be taken in and move forward as opposed to add to any uh, distress or any uh, creating new issues around something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, isn't it, you know, intention is so key actually. Um, people uh, will often pick up on intention. Intentionality, it's like reading between the lines, isn't it? It's like what we feel, you know, underneath and through the, the speech that's going on around us. It's what we actually feel often. We pick up on the, the attitude and the intentionality. And so uh, how helpful it is then to uh, try to imbue our uh, lives in community with uh, loving kindness and let that be our attitude, you know, towards one another, bringing loving kindness, bringing compassion. And we can't really go too far wrong. Um, we can still go wrong. We can still make mistakes for sure with our speech, but we're, we're liable to, you know, I notice, you know, if I have a heart of loving kindness, even if I slip up um, it verbally, people can, can often, um, you know, forgive more easily because uh, the intention is, it, it almost comes across that the intention is not to harm, it's not to hurt and harm here. Um, you know, so that's a very important point. And thank you for highlighting that for us, Anna Maya. Um, I'm not keeping up with the chat. Um, I'm gonna have a look at it now, uh, if I can figure out how to, sorry about this. I'm not very, I'm not very tech. Um, Savvy. Okay, I'm just seeing if there's anything else here. Um, yes, we've got the Pali. Thank you so much, Venerable. We've got the Pali there for people to really look at that because there's more. Um, the Pali for flattery, overflowing, piling up. Mm. Wow, you know, that's really interesting. Um, something definitely over the top and exaggerated and kind of untrue, therefore. Okay, I think that's everything at the moment in the chat. Uh, we've got 10 minutes, should we look at the next point? Let's see what comes next in this wonderful sutta uh, on non-conflict. Okay, know how to assess different kinds of pleasure uh, knowing this, pursue inner bliss. That is what I said, but why did I say it? There are these five kinds of sensual stimulation. What five? Sights known by the eye that are likable, desirable, agreeable, pleasant, sensual, and arousing. Sounds known by the ear that are likable, etc. Smells known by the nose, agreeable, pleasant. Tastes known by the tongue, delightful, agreeable. Touches known by the body that are likable, desirable, agreeable, pleasant, sensual, and arousing. These are the five kinds of sensual stimulation. The pleasure and happiness that arise from these five kinds of sensual stimulation is called sensual pleasure, karma sukha, a filthy, common, ignoble pleasure. Such pleasure should not be cultivated or developed, but should be feared, I say. Now take a mendicant who quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unskillful qualities, enters and remains in the first absorption, first jhana, which has the rapture and bliss born of seclusion while placing the mind and keeping it connected. As placing of the mind and keeping it connected are stilled, they enter and remain in the second absorption, the third, the fourth jhana. So states of Stillness, 
states of focus, peaceful and sublime states of mind. This is called the pleasure of renunciation, the pleasure of seclusion, the pleasure of peace, the pleasure of awakening. Sambodhi. Such pleasure should be cultivated and developed and should not be feared, I say. Know how to assess different kinds of pleasure. Knowing this, pursue inner bliss. That is why I said what I said, and this is why I said it. So there we are. Uh, the two different categories of pleasant experience. Sense pleasures through the five sense doors, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. Coarse, ignoble, mundane, ordinary pleasures. And the pleasure of practicing meditation, having let go of desire and aversion, uh, the possibility for the mind to experience real peace and stillness and calm. And I'm sure many of you have experienced this kind of pleasure, this kind of blissful experience in meditation where the mind is beginning to settle, the thoughts are less charged, or even they've stopped altogether, and one is able to rest and relax, practice with an object of meditation where the mind is actually able to focus and come to one-pointedness. And the Buddha is saying this kind of pleasure is uh, a pleasure that we can pursue, a pleasure that's worth cultivating, not to be feared. So isn't this interesting? He's really pointing to um, path and how through letting go, through renouncing uh, the mundane, the coarse, uh, worldly sense pleasures, how we can actually, um, through that willingness to renounce worldly pleasures and through the practice of mindfulness through developing the path factors we can then experience uh, a more one could say spiritual pleasure which is something to pursue so how interesting so anybody like to come in at this point we have just a few minutes to discuss this uh point in the again the uh, way of non-conflict. In another sutta, we know that the Buddha has told us that uh, pursuing sense pleasures is a source of conflict, um, potentially source of all the wars, all the horrible, painful, harmful things that happen between people due to pursuing, um, cultivating, making much of sense pleasures. Niada. Thank you. I think uh, meditation is a very important thing to calm us down. When, when the, the mind is calm, you, you will have power to restrain yourself to not receive it in eye, ear, or five cents of you. And that's what helpful. And, and if people surround you, you can teach them, you can show them, and everything will be fine. It's probably have less conflict. That's how I think. And that's all I want to say. Thank you so much. Sadi. Thank you so much. Uh, beautiful. Dharma, thank you. Anybody else like to comment, question? Yeah, Corinna. Well, um, yes, thank you. I, I do have a, a comment, but I'm, I'm wondering if, if Diane, I know was was earlier, she was trying to say something. I'm wondering if she still has something to say. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, can't see you there, Diana. Yeah, Diane. Okay, I'm gonna find you. Maybe not anymore. Diane, anything to say there? Okay. 
do you have anything yourself, Corinna, or just you just wanted to make sure we didn't miss? Yeah. Okay. I, no, I do have something to say. Too. You do too. Okay. I always I think... have something to say, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to, like... far away. <laughs> um, just that um, it took me, you know, over the it's over the years, it's taken me a while to understand that that this last teaching um, about sense pleasure. Um, being filthy, common, and ignoble, you know, those are such strong words, um, and especially differentiating having, leading a monastic life versus a lay life, let's say, um, and the way I make it make sense for myself is not, again, not focusing on the object per se, but the pursuit of the object, um, so it's not, I don't say, okay, I can't enjoy, I can't enjoy things, but it's more, um, do I seek after them? Do I cultivate them? Do I, you know, like, so for example, food, I would say is probably out of all those things, the one that um, is the most enjoyable <laughs> or that I could pursue. So I'm like, okay, how much, how much energy, my energy is limited, my time is limited. So how much energy do I want to spend in making food? and making really good food or making like, okay, food. <laughs> um, and it's, it's nice to enjoy, you know, good food. But then I just ask myself, am I pursuing that? Am I developing that? And, and I know for, for myself, I, I, the pleasure I get from food is not as good as the pleasure from real, from a spiritual practice, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, I really love that you brought this in, um, Corinna, because the thing is that it's experiential, isn't it? The, the whole way of practice, all the teachings of the Buddha, his invitation to us is to, yeah, listen, lend ear, you know, hear the Dharma and then uh, put it into practice, try it out, you know. And so it's really like an experiment for us to discern the truth of these teachings or not, you know, to, to investigate them. And um, I find it really uh, this to be the case and that we will be um, attached to and delighting in sense pleasures um, until we, we find, you know, perhaps, for some of us at least, until we find uh, that there are actually states of mind that are, are, are more pleasant, which are peaceful, which are not depending on, uh, you know, sense input. And this is something we, we really need to discover for ourselves, don't we? And it's a process. And um, there is a certain leap of faith, I think, for the monastics. You know, you mentioned the monastics. Well, yeah, we, we make a kind of leap of faith, which is to renounce um, quite often, probably, before we have fully let go of certain pleasures, we renounce and we see what that's like. And how does that work? How does that help um, or not? <laughs> and oftentimes we, we discover actually it's really helpful to, to renounce certain behaviors, renounce certain pleasures, um, frees us up you know, and so there's a kind of leap of faith that can happen, or it can happen through the experience of our practice that we notice things like, oh, I'm just not so interested now in spending so much time, as you say, like say, spending so much time making beautiful gourmet meals. Um, yeah, actually, oh, why don't I, why don't I spend less time cooking and I can spend more time meditating and see how that is. And, and it's just a very natural progression. I think, I think there's a place for making effort and there's a place for mindfully renouncing things to see how we can um, benefit from that. But there's also this very um, experiential uh, way of developing our practice through truly discerning uh, what gives us more happiness? What gives us more peace? What gives us more joy? Um, it's fascinating, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's a very beautiful um, journey to see how we can slowly but surely 
uh, let go, let go of so many uh, compulsions and delights even and ways of behaving and come to uh, experience having a lot more time, a lot more space and noticing that often real happiness comes from doing less, <laughs> having less, you know. Uh, it's something we discover, isn't it? Thank you very much for bringing that in, Karina. Everyone, uh, so appreciate this group. And we've run out of time for this week, but next week I will come back to where we've left off, see if there's any more to say on this point, and we'll continue with these teachings on how to uh, avoid conflict, how to promote peace and harmony in the world around us. So I hope you'll all be able to come back next week. Um, big appreciation for this time. Thanks for everyone's contributions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Acha. Thank you for the teaching. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Raya. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Lovely to see you. Take care. Good to see you, Leslie.